It is Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022, and we are here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad that you've joined us tonight. We would certainly invite you to be with us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 930 for a Bible study. We've been working our way through Paul's letters to the church at Thessalonica, so we are toward the end of 1 Thessalonians, I believe. I'm looking forward to that study. Caleb has done a great job up to this point, and of course, we anticipate great things in the future, and we are looking forward to seeing you as well at 1030 Sunday morning for our worship assembly. We plan on wrapping up a two-part series of lessons based on uh, Moses and the complaint that he had to receive from his sister and his brother, Miriam and Aaron, so we will uh, plan on wrapping that up this coming Lord's Day morning. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, if you have any concerns, if you want to know more about something that's referred to, uh, I would invite you to give us a call at 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would certainly love to hear from you. We'd love to hear feedback, especially from those of you who are watching or listening uh, on the phone line or are watching on, on YouTube through the Facebook um, interface or uh, YouTube. I guess it's announced on Facebook and plays on YouTube. To, but whatever the case is, uh, we'd love to hear back from you. Uh, last week, you may remember, we had some storms here in Madison. They came through, I think, twice on Monday and then on uh, Wednesday. And some of you might have noticed that we had some tree damage out in front of our church building last week. This is a picture from Scott and Melissa, and I believe this happened, I think this was the one that came through on Monday. Uh, some in the neighborhood were without power for several days, which is surprising in the city of Madison, but especially in the Elvium neighborhood, uh, just south of our church facility. They had a lot more damage than we had up in our area, but uh, streets were closed. Acewood was closed right in front of our building for a little bit for this. Uh, but the city came and they took care of it very quickly, so we are very very, very thankful for that. And we are especially thankful that no one was seriously injured in those storms here in Madison, at least, at least that I know of. So we praise God for that. We're certainly thankful for that good news. And uh, they've got the, the branch removed almost right away. And I don't know what they're going to do with the tree. I don't know if they've removed that completely or if they will. I'm assuming they're going to come and take that tree out completely. But just to give you a little bit of a heads up, this is what happened about a week and a half ago uh, on the east side of Madison. One thing that really impressed me uh, literally just a couple hours after that storm came through, we got a call from uh, one of the uh, Churches of Christ disaster relief organizations, and the guy just wanted to know how we were. And uh, he had called a few years ago when another tornado came through, but he called, left a message on the church line and said, hey, this is who I am. And uh, get back to me. We are here. We're ready to help send you supplies, whatever's needed. And I got back in touch with him right away, and uh, thankfully um, that was not needed at this point, and they can send that help elsewhere. But what a great thing that uh, people are watching out for us, and uh, members of the Lord's Church are certainly taking things seriously and do some great work with the disaster relief. Well, tonight we're back to the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book of beginnings. Uh, written primarily by Moses. Tonight we're wrapping up our study of the flood in Genesis chapter 9. So in chapter 6 through 8, we've seen God observe the evil on this earth. He decides to send a flood, but Noah finds grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord warns Noah and gives him 120 years to prepare. So Noah uses that time to build an ark exactly as God had instructed. So Noah obeys the Lord and then God does flood the earth just as he said he would do. And as we've learned over the past few weeks, the flood goes well beyond the 40 days of rain. And I know I mentioned that as I was growing up, I always thought in my mind, they get on the ark, it starts raining, it rains for 40 days, they get off the ark. And that is not exactly how it went down, did it? It was a lot longer than that. We looked at the timeline, we added up those uh, dates and times based on Noah's life and uh, you know what month and day we were in in his life. And uh, we figured that it is one year and 10 days from the time Noah gets on the ark to the time that he gets off the ark. So it's a lot longer than we might have assumed. So that might have been an eye-opening moment for some of us. I know it was a number of years ago when I learned that for the first time. Uh, last week at the end of Genesis 8, Noah offers a sacrifice. Remember the soothing aroma. Uh, came up and God smelled the soothing aroma. We compared it to grilling meat today. I don't know if there's any comparison, if that's fair or not, but at least when I'm grilling in the backyard, this verse is uh, something that comes to mind. It is definitely a soothing aroma. It always seems when I'm mowing the churchyard that a neighbor is grilling. I think they wait for me to start up the mower and then fire up the grill next door. But uh, we had that promise at the end of chapter 8 that as long as the earth remains, 
There will always be seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night. These things shall not cease. And we tie that to some of the panic that we see going on in the world today. Obviously, as God's people, we continue to uh, need to be stewards of our resources, conserving our resources, taking care of the earth that the Lord has given to us to use for a relatively short time. Uh, but certainly there is no need to panic or to lose sleep over what's happening to the earth. Obviously, we can do better. And yet we have this promise from the Lord that uh, there will be life on this earth. And if, if it does come to an end, it will be because he chose to bring it to an end. And this brings us to Genesis chapter 9 tonight. So we've said all this by way of very brief review. So let's pick up tonight then with Genesis chapter 9. And the first paragraph is verses 1 through 7. So if you're joining us on the phone, we're in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I have given the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your life blood. From every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood... By man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply in it. Notice in verse 1, God repeats the command that he first gave to Adam and Eve back in Genesis 1.28, where the Bible says that God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that was back in Genesis 1 addressed to Adam and Eve. But now that it's back down to Noah, Mrs. Noah, as well as their three sons and their wives, God repeats this original command. And his concern is you need to be fruitful and multiply. So you need to get busy filling the earth. You need to get back to this original mission. We are starting over in a sense at this point. In verses 2 and 3, God then announces a change in what human beings are allowed to eat. So speaking of grilling in the backyard, I think this is an appropriate thing for us to look at tonight. Obviously, previously, God had given us every green plant for food. And again, that goes back to Genesis 129, where God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth. And every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. So in the garden, God said, this is what you are allowed to eat. Well, from the beginning, humans then were to be vegetarians. But I want us to notice now, after the flood, God opens it up, doesn't he? And giving Noah and his descendants permission, we might say, to eat all kinds of animals. Into your hand they are given, God says. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. And I do find it interesting that as soon as God opens it up for the eating of animals, this is also when lifespans decrease, isn't it? And I know we've talked about the environment changing after the flood, and uh, there is a chance that this plays in here as well. I think probably a lot of doctors today would recommend that we eat more plants and eat less animals because of the uh, health effects, obviously. But I just wanted to point that out while we're here, that from this point on, uh, lifespans uh, take a nosedive. Uh, but to be fair, as I understand it, God starts by causing animals to be afraid of human beings. You know, previously, people and animals were more at ease with each other, and they would get along with each other, maybe the best way of putting it, uh, for many years. My sister was a vegetarian, and I, I uh, admire her for that. I think I remember one of her bumper stickers or maybe a, a poster in her room. Uh, something along those lines said something like this, Cows are my friends, and I don't eat my friends. And uh, that's a pretty good slogan, isn't it? And I'm thinking um, that's kind of what it was like before the flood. Animals back then might have been a bit like our family pets are today. They were, the f they were friends, for uh, lack of a better way of putting that. Uh, but now, though, notice in Genesis 9, before God declares open season on animals, 
He actually puts the terror of mankind on every beast of the earth and on every beast of uh, bird of the sky with every cre thing that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. And so uh, today when we go fishing, uh, we generally don't just walk up to the water and, um, and have fish jump out into our hands. That's really not the way it normally goes down. And, you know, the hunter goes out in the woods. The deer don't generally just walk up and lay down in front of the tree stand. Uh, turkeys and pheasants don't just walk up to the hunter out there in the field either, but these creatures are generally skittish, aren't they? They are afraid of us. They try to get away. They see us coming, they move, and they warn each other, and they, they do all the stuff to do the best that they can to, to uh, stay alive. So hunting and fishing, then, it can be a challenge, and it can be a rewarding challenge. It is a, a wonderful hobby or pastime or a way to provide food for the family table, and so as a result of the animals being afraid of us now, now we need fancy lures, don't we? We need the equipment. We need uh, uh, the rods and reels. We need the camo and the tree stands and the blinds. We cover ourselves with scent and paint our faces and make fake calls and, and perfect rods and reels and arrows and weapons and traps that will try to overcome this fear that God put in the animals. And it is this uh, lifelong pursuit for a lot of people. Of course, there are exceptions to this, and I'm trying to anticipate what you're thinking as we read this passage. And, you know, not all animals are really afraid of people, and that's true. Some animals are domesticated. Uh, some animals can be trained to be around us. But just generally speaking, as a general rule, animals are afraid of human beings. And this goes back to Genesis chapter 9, when God opens the door for us eating them. <laughs> Of course, we don't have to eat animals if we don't choose to do that. Uh, some may choose to stick with the plants, and that is certainly okay. That's up to you. But I'm just saying, scripturally speaking, we do have options now. Um, we are not limited, according to God's will, um, to eating plants as they once were. So if you enjoy hunting or fishing, uh, the next time you're out in the field, the next time you climb a tree, the next time you're out in a boat on the water... Uh, just remember that God made those animals afraid of you for a reason. And I think he did it to make it fair. This is, uh, this is part of it. It's not morally wrong to hunt and fish, but far from it. Um, I think God could anticipate this, and uh, God has a great uh, sense of humor, I think, sometimes. But uh, he takes care of this objection, and he gives his permission here. Uh, but first of all, God does make it fair. So you can now eat the animals, but by the way, five minutes ago, I made him terrified of you. So have fun with that. Seems to be what he's uh, saying here. Uh, we do have a restriction, though. Notice this in verse 4. When you kill an animal to eat it, God says you shall only... You shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So the restriction on eating animals is that we are not to eat or drink an animal's blood. I do find it interesting that this seems to be repeated, at least somewhat, in the Law of Moses. Obviously it is, Leviticus 9.26 and a number of other verses. Uh, but there is a brief passing reference in the New Covenant as well, over in Acts 15.29, that letter... Uh, the apostles and elders sent out to the uh, new congregations, those Gentile congregations, they were having some issues on this. And one of the restrictions that they gave there was that they were still not to eat uh, things, I think, strangled or uh, drink or eat blood. And uh, this, by the way, is tied to uh, the animals being strangled. So the reason for not eating an animal that's been strangled is because the blood is still in the body. So the blood has to be drained before we were to eat it. And um, the reason for this is, Blood seems to be symbolic of life. The life is in the blood. Uh, there is something special. There is something sacred about blood. Ultimately, of course, this seems to be tied to the sacrifices and ultimately to the sacrifice of Jesus that's coming in the future from this perspective. I don't know whether you've noticed the passage that we've had on the wall for the Lord's Supper for several weeks now. I try to change the passage every few weeks, leave it there for a few weeks to let it soak in. But for the past few weeks, you may notice that we've been using Hebrews 9.22, where the Bible says, And according to the law, one must almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And the author of Hebrews uses this to emphasize the importance of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross. He wasn't strangled, he didn't drown. Uh, but he died in a way where blood was shed or poured out for us. And so the life is in the blood. Well, this is obvious to us now. We understand scientifically the importance of blood. 
But we haven't always understood the importance of blood, even in the fairly recent past in our history as a nation. We think of the practice of bloodletting. Uh, even here in the United States, where doctors would sometimes attempt to treat an illness by draining blood from the body. And to us, that seems absolutely ridiculous. What in the world were they thinking? But that was the latest in scientific theory a couple hundred years ago. But God, though, emphasizes that the life is in the blood. And certainly today we understand blood supplies oxygen throughout the body. Uh, blood helps clear waste throughout the body. A number of uh, vital functions that blood provides in the human body. It is critically important. And obviously God has understood this all along, that the life is in the blood. Well, this, of course, has some implications for those who take a human life in verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. So this is a basic principle that's outlined here. God allows, or in this case, we might even say demands the death penalty at this point. And the reason is blood is valuable. Blood is sacred. And if you shed the blood of a fellow human being, you are guilty of shedding that blood. And somebody has to pay for that. A price has to be paid. There are consequences for taking a human life. Well, of course, we're under a new covenant today. We're not under this. Uh, we don't personally execute the death penalty in the Lord's church. If somebody were to kill another human being, the elders don't go out, you know, in a like execution squad kind of thing. Uh, but we do have secular government now that has been given the job of maintaining law and order. And we leave that to them, as I understand it. In Romans 13, Paul refers to the governing authorities. He says that they do not bear the sword in vain. Well, we ask ourselves, what in the world is that about? And it seems that it perhaps is tied to this understanding that when somebody sheds the blood of another human, um, that person's blood may need to be shed. And my personal opinion on the death penalty has shifted a little bit through the years. Uh, the Bible certainly allows it, the reference there in Romans chapter 13, but we do seem to have some issues as to how it's carried out these days. Uh, we have some very concerning economic and racial disparities with the death penalty today. Then we also have the 30-year gap uh, between the crime and the execution. That makes no sense to me, and I don't know about you, but if somebody commits a crime back in 1990, and we hear on the news that they're executed like last week, um, that, that makes no sense. That is not the way it seems that God designed that way back when. So I'm just pointing out there are some issues with it today. Um, and then I've had 30 years where I've been able to visit and correspond with people in some of our most maximum security facilities. You know, people who have torched cars and killed their families and done all kinds of terrible things. And if they had been executed years ago, uh, we would not have had those opportunities. I would not have the opportunity to sit down with them in the prison to open the word of God. So I'm not, I'm not uh, certainly not suggesting the death penalty is, is always wrong. Certainly not far from it. Um, but we do have some concerns, and it can be open for discussion. It's something that God's people do need to be concerned about and study that and pray through it. Um, but I'm just saying that it's opened up here in Genesis chapter 9 with this emphasis on the value of blood. If somebody sheds man's blood, uh, by man his blood shall be shed. Uh, the other part of this passage is the reminder in verse 7, As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply in it, as obviously we have seen before. So just have that uh, reminder, we might say, at the end of this paragraph. Well, let's pick up tonight with Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you. Of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud, 
And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So notice in this passage, we have the rainbow, don't we? As God's promise that he will never again destroy the earth with water as he did during the flood. And from this day forward, when it rains, God will also send the rainbow as a reminder that today's rain will not result in a worldwide catastrophe. Remember, before the flood, it had never rained. And then the flood came with rain for the very first time for 40 days and 40 nights and all of that. And I'm just imagining that when it rained for the first time after the flood, there might have been a little bit of panic. Can you imagine that? It's never rained. It rains for 40 days, 40 nights, everything dies. Everything clears off. They come out of the ark. A few days later, oh no, <laughs> this is it. We're all going to die. And I'm thinking there is that panic that would set in there. And so to counter this, God sends the rainbow as the sign of this agreement that he's um, making here that he will never again flood the whole world as he did in the days of Noah. We still have local floods. Some of those can be incredibly devastating, but we'll never again have another worldwide flood. There's a day coming when the world will be destroyed by fire, but never again by water. Uh, just a few brief notes before we move on here. Uh, the rainbow has been, uh, I think we might say, uh, taken uh, over, hasn't it? It's been, I don't know, hijacked is a pretty strong word. But when we see a rainbow today, we don't always think about Noah and the Great Flood, but we should. And let's uh, take that as a reminder uh, that uh, the rainbow is for that purpose. It was established by God as this reminder that the earth will never be destroyed um, by water again. Fire, yes. Uh, but water, no. Another thing that uh, caught my attention when we were studying from the book of Revelation, and I think it was chapter 4 with the rainbow around the throne of God. You know, we often think, oh, look, in Revelation we see the rainbow around the, around the throne. That came from Genesis. And yet we need to remember that the rainbow around the throne came first, didn't it? That rainbow was there. And so it's not that God took the rainbow from the earth and put it around his throne, but rather it was the other way around. There has always been that rainbow around his throne. And he took that and he used that as a reminder that he would never flood the earth with water again. And I would also point out in this passage, it seems the reminder is more for God than it is for the people. And so God will see this rainbow and remember the covenant, but certainly it is a good reminder for us as well. Um, as we apply what we've learned about the flood, let's take a few moments to do that. And I want us to uh, apply this passage, these chapters about the flood, the way Peter applies this passage many years later. Over in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 14. So 2 Peter 3, 3 through 14. So as we study the flood, we haven't had a really good application of what this actually means for us. And so Peter answers the so what question. And this is 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 3 through 14. Notice how Peter applies his knowledge of the flood. He says, know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And then he continues on from there. Feel free to read the rest of that chapter. And there's so much more we could say about this passage, but I just want to point out that Peter refers to the flood as a real event. It's not a myth. It's not something that somebody says happened that we really don't believe, but this is a real thing. It is a real event. It is history. And he ties it to the coming judgment. So when people mock us for a warning about what's coming, and they say, oh, nothing has ever happened. It's all been the same, and it'll always be the same. Um, they forget that God has destroyed the world before, and what he's done with water, he will do again, but with fire next time. And Peter's point in saying these things is to warn us that since there is a day of judgment on the horizon, we must be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless. So what does the flood mean for us? It means that we need to get ready for God's final judgment that is still to come. He judged the earth once, and he'll do it again. And as we discussed a couple weeks ago, the evidence for a worldwide flood is literally all around us. We have fossilized animals buried in mud virtually everywhere on this planet. In deserts, on the highest mountains, in the steps of the Wisconsin State Capitol building, even in a cave right down the road from us in Blue Mound, Wisconsin, we have fossilized sea creatures all around the world. And just as God warned Noah, so also God has warned us. So this is what the flood actually means for us. Let's go back to Genesis and close tonight with Genesis chapter 9. Verses 18 through 29. Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan! A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Starting in verse 18, we have a record of what happens after the flood. Noah starts farming. He plants a vineyard. He makes wine. This is the first reference to wine in the Bible, and it is not good, is it? It is a very negative reference. Uh, Noah gets drunk, and as we know today, being drunk gets people in trouble sometimes, and they do stupid things, they make bad choices, and things get ugly. And so here Noah gets drunk, and um, years ago when I did the Citizen Academy with the Madison Police Department, one of the officers said something to the class. Something to the effect that, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of the calls that they respond to here in Madison are either caused by or made worse by the use and abuse of alcohol. And that, that was shocking to me. I mean, I knew it was an issue. I had no idea the numbers were that high. That was just his estimate. But uh, 80 to 90 percent of the calls that they go on are either caused by or made worse by the use of alcohol. 
So if alcohol were to somehow just poof, miraculously disappear off the face of the earth, basically Madison cops would suddenly find themselves bored on the job. And that's the truth. It, you know, uh, as it is, though, alcohol in this city makes pretty much every call worse from domestic violence to traffic offenses to sexual offenses to child neglect and abuse, homelessness, uh, absolutely everything. Um, is there a verse in the Bible that, that says, thou shalt not drink alcohol in any form under any circumstances? Uh, I have not found that verse yet. There are some positive references to wine in the Bible. Psalm 104, 15, for example, the inspired psalmist praises God for providing wine, which makes, the, makes man's heart glad, makes his face glisten with oil, that kind of thing. In Deuteronomy 14, 26, there is a provision in the law for when the people are too far to travel to Jerusalem. They are actually told to use their tithe money, the money they would have donated to the Lord. They are to use that money to purchase, among other things, strong drink or whatever your heart desires and to consume these items in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And then Moses also says, also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town when you do these things. In other words, invite the local priest to your celebration. So there are times then when wine and even strong drink was a blessing of some kind. But we also need to realize that there are many, many more passages outlining the dangers of alcohol. If you remember our study of Nadab and Abihu a few months ago, the priests were prohibited from drinking on the job. Remember that? They offered the unauthorized fire to the Lord. They were burnt to a crisp. The lightning bolt, the fire from heaven came down and just torched them right there on the spot. Everybody was quiet. You know, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, basically is what Moses reminds the people. And then immediately after that, as I understand it, God basically says, oh, by the way, priests are not to drink on the job. And that's a strange reference right there. And so it seems to me that what these two men did might have been motivated by, by alcohol. Uh, those who took the Nazarite vow were forbidden completely from drinking any form of wine. Not only wine, they were also prohibited even from touching grapes. That's how serious that vow was. And then we probably have dozens upon dozens of passages warning against the dangers of drunkenness. Do not get drunk. Don't even start the process of getting drunk. Don't go there. Don't head down that road. Don't even go in that direction. Well, having said this, and in light of so many warnings about the danger of drinking, uh, we've made the decision in our family to abstain. And that has been my decision from long ago, and I don't go in that direction. I've told the church years ago when I preached on this, I have seen what I could do to a bag of Cheetos or whatever, and I just, I don't need that complication in my life. I don't need to go in that direction. Um, it is a dangerous road to travel. The elders of this congregation have also made the commitment to abstain completely. We're doing the best we can to lead by example in this regard. As we've discussed many times before, Wisconsin has one of the highest rates of binge drinking in the nation. So think about that. Wisconsin is among the worst in the nation for binge drinking. Dane County has the highest rate of binge drinking in the state of Wisconsin. And Madison has the highest rate in the county. Does that make sense? So of all people on the face of the planet, <laughs> You know, we are surrounded by it. It is worse here than it is just about anywhere. And if you've lived here for any length of time, you know this, and you know this from experience. We are surrounded by it. And there are people who are struggling with it. On any given Sunday, just looking at the statistics based on the percentage of people who are struggling with drinking in this area, uh, I can confidently say that we probably have several people in our assembly every Lord's Day who are just barely hanging on to sobriety. And I don't know if we realize that. And we hate to be a stumbling block. If you struggle with this, we would invite you to reach out. We'd like to pray with you and encourage you if we can, if there's something that we can do to urge you to turn away from that, if there's some way we can give you strength in this regard, uh, we would love to communicate with you. I would personally suggest AA or some other 12-step program as a resource, as a place to get started. There are some good things 
uh, that can happen through those programs. Uh, but there are many warnings in the Bible about the danger of drunkenness, and Genesis 9 seems to be one of those passages. But here, though, I would point out that the issue is less with Noah himself, isn't it, and more with how the people react to his drunkenness. So Noah gets drunk, he gets naked in his tent. Um, is it wrong to get naked in your tent? No, the issue here is that Noah's son, um, Ham, sees his father, uh, most likely passed out based on what comes next in this passage. And instead of dealing with this respectfully on his own, what does he do? He goes out and gets his brothers so they can see what's going on. And as I understand what happens here, Ham sees that his father's drunk and naked, maybe passed out in the tent, and he goes and he gets his brothers. Hey, you'll never guess what dad is doing. You got to see this. Come in here with me. Look at what dad did. Okay, that seems to be what's going on here. And he disrespects his father in that process. He embarrasses his father. And most of this falls on Ham. Notice when the other two brothers come in, they do what Ham should have done, don't they? They don't look, but they turn away. They back their way in, you know, holding this uh, piece of clothing or robe or whatever is between them, and they very respectfully cover their father. So the main issue here is how Ham responds to his father's drunkenness. Well, starting in verse 24, we've got the consequences. When Noah awakes from his wine, see the reference to being passed out? At least in my mind, that's the picture that comes to mind. When he awakes from his wine, he realizes what has happened here. That all comes together. Maybe his wife tells him, I don't know. And in response, he curses Canaan, the descendant of Ham, suggesting that he will be a servant to his brothers. And that's kind of weird. So I'm, I'm assuming that Canaan must have had, his grandson must have had a part in this. We aren't told. There's some blanks that are not filled in here. So some things we may want to assume, but I, I would not you know, crank down on that as being absolute rock solid truth. This just seems to be, otherwise, why would he curse uh, the grandson for doing this? I'm assuming that he was involved in some way. But uh, Noah blesses the other two sons, Shem and Japheth. Those two did the right thing. This is what you need to do. If you find your dad in this situation, this is how you handle it. Uh, not like Ham did. So Ham, uh, maybe his son, disrespected the head of the family. And they are cursed for doing this. Um, strangely, some have used this passage to try to justify slavery. And uh, even in modern times, I mean, modern, like the past several hundred years here in the United States, even there were churches that uh, use this. Oh, it's the curse, you know, on Canaan. He's going to be a, a servant, a slave from here on out kind of thing. And, and this justifies what we're doing. But I mean, I would just point out that is just completely taking this passage out of context. This has nothing to do uh, with the United States of America in the uh, in the 1800s. So I just wanted to throw that in here, that when you read the commentaries on this passage, that's something that'll come up. And then we end with the reminder that Noah lives for another 350 years, and he dies at the ripe old age of 950 years. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. I hope you could be with us next week as we study Genesis 10, which is basically another list of names, uh, the descendants of Noah. We aren't usually thrilled by the genealogies, but please come back and uh, we'll look at that chapter together. I'm assuming it'll be a little bit shorter, kind of like the list of genealogies was a few weeks ago. But let's try to find a few lessons from those genealogies and those names in uh, Genesis chapter 10 next week. So thank you for joining us tonight. I know we've discussed a lot. Uh, but let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being a God of both justice and mercy, judgment and love. We've seen this all combined in the great flood. You recognize Noah as a righteous man. You provided a way for him and for his family to be saved. At the same time, we've also seen Noah at his worst. And we've seen the damage and broken relationships that sin and specifically alcohol and drunkenness can cause within a family. Tonight, Father, we ask for courage in maintaining the struggle against sin. We ask for your grace and for your mercy as well, and we pray that we would lean on our Christian family for help, and we pray that we would rely on the resources that are available to us for overcoming the slavery to alcohol. Tonight, we pray especially for the seniors of the congregation as they face their own challenges. We pray that all of us would be a blessing to each other. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. We come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.